in, uh, in the state of Illinois, in the Chicago area. I worked at a day school for special ed for about 33 years, the last four part-time, after I semi-retired. During that time, I became real interested in trying to figure out why these kids had the problems. And so I went back to school in the early 80s and got my doctorate with an emphasis in neuropsych. And at that point in time, there, George Hine was starting to talk about a field called school neuropsychology. And I consider myself on the first school neuropsychologist, even though there is no, at that time, no certification. About 10, 15 years ago, there was more of a push to try to get school neuropsychologists, or what you would call education neuropsychologists, people that would use neuropsychology, but do it in the schools. Um, one of the frustrations we've had with a lot of pediatric neuropsychs that didn't have a background in school is when they did the reports, they were very clinical. They weren't real helpful in the schools. And so what we wanted to do was to create a, pro a profession where we use the knowledge that we have on neuropsychology, basically brain function, and be able to apply it in the schools. And what I do is very different than a pediatric neuropsychologist. The pediatric neuropsychologists are the, are the ones that are involved in a lot of medical type of things. You know, I've got a smattering of knowledge about, you know, tumors and seizures and things like that, but I'm primarily educationally oriented. And so my talk here is going to be educational orientation. My understanding is most of you, or, or not all of you, are educational psychologists. Anybody not? One, okay. But I can assume it's education. Because <laughs> that's the emphasis of what, what I'm going to talk about here. Um, in the States, we've got this thing called RTI occurring, where the number of people are saying we don't need to do assessments. We don't need process assessment. You know, potential achievement discrepancy model is, i say, the research doesn't hold true, and I agree with that part. But I disagree with the RTI people that tell us that RTI, response intervention, which doesn't need an assessment, is good for everybody. It's good for the majority of students. And you guys are already doing that, I understand, in Ireland. I can't remember what you call it, but where students are getting services that if they need it before assessment occurs. You're only doing assessing, you know, the severest and the severe, the continuum, right? And that's good, because I, I don't think most kids in the, in the states that we've been labeled special ed or special ed. They were just kids that need more reading help or math help, all right? But there is a percentage in school districts. If you're working in a high SES area, the kids need, you, mean, you might have 2% of your population that need further assessment. If you're working in a low SES area, you might have 25%, all right? When I say we need further assessment because we need to know the why. Why aren't they learning? You know, they're not responding to interventions. The RTI people in the states, you know, are saying we don't need to do that. So we have a battle going on. I need to give you some of that background as well. About 10, well, I guess 12 years ago, one of my former practice students, over the years I had over 150 practice students, and that we have in our education system a little different than yours. Students take classes for two years, and then they go to have an intern, full-year internship for a year. So it's actually a three-year program to get their EDS. Right? Most, most school psychologists do not have uh, doctorates, but it is a three-year degree. During that second year, they have to do a two-day-a-week practicum, right? and then do a five-day-a-week internship. In the years that I was working, you know, I had over 20 interns and 150 practices, so we are used to working with students like that. Yeah, a lot of them, huh? But one of my former practice students who was in charge of the program at Loyola University and brought me in because I've been doing neuropsych stuff in the schools since the early mid-80s. I diagnosed my first executive function disorder in 1981, all right, which is unheard of. I mean, I don't know about it here in Ireland, but executive function disorders is one of the big things. We're going to talk a little bit about that here today as well. Lord brought me in to start teaching, and I found I like teaching. So in retirement, I now teach three-quarter time. I refuse to go full-time to be full-time in the of politics. But I like to teach. I teach lots and lots of classes, but my big specialties are the biobasis, which is intro to the neural site. And I teach psychopathology as well as supervised practicum and interns. Um, in British Bell, we've got a new doctoral program for where we're giving a doctorate in school neuropsychology, or you can also get in pediatric neuropsychology. It's, it's designed to 
time for second school psychologists that are working full time, which is a totally unique kind of concept. And I feel good for they started to develop that. I'm here on a crusade. And that's why I'm doing these. I could I could easily be, be retired and playing golf five days a week instead of two. All right? I did get a round this morning. I could get good weather for once. Um, but I'm on a crusade because I believe the future of educational psychologists, <coughs> school psychologists, is going to be school neuropsychology. I can tell you that and some pretty good feedback for people who know this stuff, that the new WISC-5, when it comes out, they're trying to computerize it, where it's going to be all done on a computer. You're not going to be carrying a little kid with you. I know for a fact that's what they're going to do with KBC because I work with one of the people who are working with the Coffins, uh, like Fletcher Jansen. Um, and they are, they are going to do everything in their power. The new KBC, when it comes out, probably in two years, it's going to be totally computerized. But that's not where it's going to be. There's some young people in this room right here. I would just about guarantee that before you're done with your careers, you're not going to have test kits at all. You're not going to be doing test kits. You're going to be doing brain scans. And you're going to be reading brain scans. And you're going to be taking those brain scan information and you're going to be putting it in to brain-based therapies, of which we're just starting right now. Some of the things that we're doing with neurofeedback, with CogMed, you know, it, it's amazing. Well, we're just at the tip of these things. And these, these things are going to be considered rough by then. I'm going to say we're going to start seeing some of this stuff starting to happen within 10 to 15 years. We don't have the capability right now of doing diagnosis by brain scan. We don't have normative basis. We're in the process, and there's a couple of universities working on it, where they're developing databases for fMRI results, <coughs> for QEG results. And as we get normative basis, we're going to be getting closer and closer to doing diagnostics. We're already starting to use brain scans to measure the efficacy of certain medications. Our has been doing this with some of the ADHD stuff now for five years. They're doing it with depression. They're doing it with anxiety disorders. All right? The Wayne Fletcher Jantz, the first working at KBC, they're trying to get some research facilities where they're going to try <coughs> to brain scan the KBC results. So we can see, are we really measuring what we say we're measuring? One of the problems we've had in psychology in general, especially school psychology, is, I don't know about you, but I always, we always talk about evidence-based interventions. You don't look at evidence, most evidence-based interventions, the research, it is research, it's abysmal. And most of it is research. It's evidence, I mean, it's like testimonials of half the stuff. One of the things we're trying to do with the Chicago School, which is where I'm working now, is, is our doc students are coming in, and they're going to start on their dissertations from the day they arrive. And every time they work with a student, do an assessment, and do an intervention, we're going to be using single subject design research. And they're going to take <coughs> the accumulation of their single subject design research, and as their dissertation, they're going to put it all together. We're going to be taking all these students' research over the years, and we're getting it. We're going to come out with research. We're going to tell you if this stuff is really working. Right? Brain based assessment and intervention were in the infancy. Those young people here today are going to take it for granted. If Here's my crusade. If what you call educational psychologists do not let another profession steal this from us, it's very possible that this is going to occur. But if we're not the people who do it, somebody's going to do it for us. And, we're, and the jobs you see today are not going to be there. So <coughs> I hope I can generate some interest in this whole field. What I intend on doing here today is I've got a PowerPoint here. I'm going to fly through most of the PowerPoint. I've got well-educated people here. You don't need me to read you slides. I'm going to highlight some of them. 
My goal is to get you interested. I'm not going to give you the knowledge that you're necessarily going to come out of here with the skills you're going to use. What I want to do is generate that curiosity. Because the one thing I know about most school psychologists, and I'm going to, what I'm finding the same thing is true of educational psychologists here in Ireland, is that I get you curious, you're going to go out and you're going to look. You're going to try to get more information. I'm going to give you a couple resources. I'm going to give you a bibliography. I'm going to give you two worksheets that you can start playing around with. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So you are going to come out of here with, with some things. But again, I'm not going to cover most of these, uh, these slides to generate interest. Now, I was told that I might have a lot of people coming from the other workshop, but this one, nobody looks quite new. You may be the only one. <laughs> um, so there's going to be some, there's some overlap between the two, but I didn't include a lot of that stuff that I wasn't sure what to do. Anyway, so we're going to talk mostly about behavioral and social disorders. Oh, yes, let's pass these out. The first thing you're going to be getting is the PowerPoint. The second thing I want to pass out here is a bibliography. This is a bibliography of suggested books with, and, and with recommendations on some resources because I feel like most psychologists I know we love to buy books. All right. All right. The next thing I'm going to do is give you a worksheet and explain it to you. I'm looking at executive function disorders. And last, we're not going to use this one a lot because I may, and I'll talk a little bit about it. But one of the things that we need to be doing is looking at left and right hemisphere kinds of functions and the differences they do because of the thing. Again, it's just a resource. You're not going to get really a lot of training in it, but I want to expose you to it. I need to give credit where credit is due. You'll notice that there's initials after my name. You have to sign the obviously doctor psychology, and then it says ABSNT. What does ABSNT stand for? It stands for the American Board of School Neuropsychology. This is you know, this is a board that will certify if you go through their program, or if you've got good enough training on the program, you just take the, the exams and, the, and stuff. It's got the recommendation of two school neuropsychologists that any certified school psychologist can go through. You do not have to have your doctor, which is different than the, general, the pediatric neuropsychology degrees. Uh, and if you want board certification uh, with them, you have to have your doctorate for all or at least a couple of them. But the ADSNP, you do not have to have your doctor. You need to be a certified or licensed, whatever it is, that you, how you get your, what do you get, license or certification? Registration. 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 Okay. Right. So if you're registered, you can go through the program. It's a program that is pretty much online. It encompasses nine to ten weekends during the year, once a month, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You would obviously have a six-hour time difference, but it's <coughs> something you consider doing. Um, they may also be recording them where you can do them through the you know the video recordings of the information. The nice thing about it is, is for every session <coughs> they're teaching, you've got the expert in that area, all right, and which is really neat. But again, if anyone wants further information on that, I understand at the end of this is going to be a short break, and I'll give you information on that. But a lot of the slides show the slides on here are adapted or actually from part of the program here, and I need to give credit where credit is due. Dr. Dan Miller, who runs the program. Do you know Dan? Um, unbelievable little guy. He's pretty much set up the program and has arranged for the instructors and everything else. And so he's given me permission to use some of these slides because, again, we're trying to generate in interest in the field, and this is one way to get further training. Um, Bill, can I just ask you if, um, if outsiders, say for somebody from this side of the world, wants to take that diploma, you know, that boarding. They can. Uh, they can, and will they be able to practice in the States? You'd have to be certified. Now, this is, this, okay, this board, board certification, 
does not mean that you're certified or licensed. It means that the board recognizes that you've got skills above and beyond the average person doing. It, it does not necessarily give you licensure or, re or registration or certification. Okay. Right? But it would be recognized. Okay. So if you're looking for a, if you still got to go through the licensing, you want to be licensed mm -hmm. or certified. Um, we got. Would it be recognized for teaching still in some universities? Yeah. I mean, you've got to get a certificate. Yeah, board certified. I mean, board certification is only as good as whoever is honoring. It doesn't matter what the board certification is. I don't believe board certification as a pediatric neuropsychologist may make a state stuff get the license. So, so that the same thing. Anyway, what is neuropsychology? Does anybody, we should find this out. Can everybody hear me? Am I projecting? Uh, yeah. Okay, I don't need a microphone. Where's the best place for me to stand so I'm not standing in the way? I, I just realized this room is so small. Maybe I should stand back there. Huh? No. Uh, no. Over here better than over there? Yep. Right, you guys can see? Yeah. I tend to wander, so yeah. I guess okay. All right. Anyway, what is neuropsychology? It's a study and understanding of brain behavior relationships. All right, why aren't we working here? Okay. Why do I feel that you need to know this information? There's three reasons. Understanding how the brain works allows us to, first of all, understand the uniqueness of the students we work with. Every student is different. There are similarities, but they're all different. And the problem with the uniqueness is, sometimes it gets very difficult to accept the students who, are, who, who they are and what they are. One of the disadvantages of working in a day school for special ed, and this was not a therapeutic, we, we, we had, I call it square peg school. The district did not know what to do with it, they sent it to us. And we had everything, autistic, we had Asperger's, we had high functioning retardation, we had TBIs, we had acquired brain injuries, so we had syndromes you never heard of, or I still never heard of. We had ADHD kids, we had kids didn't have diagnosis, nobody knew what the problems were. All right? But you get to some of these kids, and some of these kids are just not nice kids. You ever had a not a nice kid that nobody wants to work with? In all my years, by understanding that much of what these kids are doing is not volitional behavior, it's the result of how their brain works, allowed me to understand and accept them. I will admit, there's two types of disabilities to this day I cannot work successfully with. I don't deal well with sociopaths. <laughs> All right? I have a problem accepting I know it's there. I know there's causes for it. But I, but there's no success with them. All right? True sociopath. Now, I've had kids that people call sociopaths that, in my opinion, work. But I've had a couple that were true sociopaths. And I just couldn't. The other one is psychotic depression. I, I'm not qualified to work with. The kind of thing impressed people are too suicidal and I don't want that responsibility because I don't feel confident. But anybody else I've been able to accept. I've been able to accept and try and get other people to accept who they are and what they are because it's not under necessarily their volitional control. We can help <coughs> a lot of these problems get it under volitional control, but sometimes we can't. <coughs> And as far as school psychologists go, by having this knowledge allows me to provide more meaningful, realistic, and efficient interventions for academic, social, and behavioral functioning. And that's what it really comes down to, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Providing intervention. If you truly understand why it is happening, it's going to allow you to do the what and the how. But it all starts with why. I have found that most school psychologists are not strict behaviorists. Most of us believe that there's something that goes on between our ears. Some of the, even in our, our age of RTI, the best attended sessions that we have at our conferences are those given by the well-known school neuropsychopediatric neuropsychologists. Steve Pfeiffer was the name that just draws in crowds. Anytime Steve Pfeiffer talks, he basically talks in reading, math, and writing skills. Um, he's 
some of the books, uh, books that uh, Tom Alley recommended, unless they anything written by him. The findings very, very readable, very understandable. It'll tell you what you want to know, and it's, and it's going to talk to the same thing. The first one's that fill up. He's always filled. Much before all these other things. Neuropsychology in the States, especially by school psychologists, is high interest. Because most of us want to know why. Not everybody. I work with two professors who came out of the University of Oregon. And, you know, and they're dead set. They think we're all nuts. But I'm a behaviorist. I'm a family therapist. I did, I've done therapy for years. Uh, I've been in schools now. I've had private practice for 17 years. I mean, I, I think the more tools I have my bag of tricks, the better I'm going to be. But everything comes down to the brain eventually. The brain is involved. All right, I have all these things up here that I seem to be stuck on. Does anybody know how to get me out of here? <coughs> okay. <coughs> I don't know what this stuff is here. See, there's a very, like, just the left hand corner. Yeah, there. I know. Is there a way of getting rid of it? Well, I think that should be. Oh, so see, see the arrow that's beside the, the first point, and you have to ah. push them all in, I think. See, this is the double arrow. Um, yeah. no, we'll try to keep off of them. Yeah. So they tried yeah. shutting them off earlier, but now this thing has expanded. <laughs> I don't know. I see what they're saying. These double arrows yeah, right yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. At least we got that much gone. Yeah. All right. All right, we're looking at the brain. I was told that most of you have had a class in neuroanatomy of some kind. Mm -hmm. You have a general idea of what the brain looks like with the cortex and the subcortical areas. So we're going to review some of those two real basic functions. Um, but I think that the thing here is that emotions are extremely complex brain functions involving multiple areas. I was giving this real lecture, I give you an introduction to Luria. You know, who, who's battle, I lead in and follow very strongly. But we don't have time. Emotional core of the brain is the limbic system. This is where the senses and awareness are first processed in the brain. Mood and personality are mediated through the prefrontal cortex. This is the part of the brain that's the center of higher cognitive and emotional functioning. All right? So, for emotional and behavior, we're going to be looking primarily at some subcortical areas, which is the limbic system, and we're going to be looking at the prefrontal cortex, what is known as executive function. Oh, now i got all these things on the map. Which one is that? Yeah. 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 Okay. Why does it keep doing this to me? <laughs> um, a brain diagram, what we're going to be looking primarily at here is this called limbic cortex. It's not limbic. What this is, is it's, it's an area called the anterior cingulate gyrus. We're going to be looking at the anterior portion of it. This is considered part of the prefrontal cortex generally. Sometimes it's considered part of the limbic system. We're going to be looking at this part of the prefrontal cortex, orbitofrontal and the dorsolateral areas. And what we're going to do is we're going to call them something different. We're going to be looking at particularly the amygdala, <coughs> A little bit with the hippocampus areas, right? When we're dealing with emotion, and a lot with it's not up here in the basal ganglia areas. So we're pretty much going to concentrate on those in this brief talk. Again, another diagram, a little bit different. Um, hypothalamus. I'm going to skip. As you can see, I'm going to skip through a lot of these things real quickly. The one thing I have to mention is the thalamus. You need to be aware. So the thalamus, all the input, everything that goes from, comes into you besides smell, comes in through your sensory organ and ends up going to the thalamus. The thalamus is where it gets directed. This, this region is absolutely critical when we talk about PTSD and phobias. Your amygdala, 
is basically this a cortical area that deals with emotions. All right. When we're, when we're talking about like anxiety disorders in particular, we're going to be dealing a lot with the amygdala. It's the love and serotonin. This is the area that the SSRI is really working on. Um, is it, the other thing that it is, it's the center for emotional aspects of memory. Memory is a highly complex function. We're going to talk about the hippocampus is where non-emotional memory is consolidated. All right. When, I, when we talk about memory, we're going to do a real simplify. We have rote memory, which is very sensory specific. That combines with the prefrontal cortex area, the dorsolateral areas, which is a regulator of cognition. All right? That creates working memory. In order to go into long-term memory, we have to consolidate it. The hippocampus area, the subcortical area, is where these memories go. And working memory is very active. Rote memory and long-term memory are very passive. It's your working memory that sort of works with these kinds of things, puts them together, and then stores long-term memories in the cortex, in various areas, right? With the exception of emotions. Emotions appear to be stored in the amygdala, which is one of the reasons that if you want to remember something, the two best ways of remembering things is one, you have high emotional content to it. So why don't you remember this? I should be all scaring the Jesus out of you. <laughs> all right, that make you laugh hysterically. Can't do it. So, uh, so hopefully we'll rely on the second area, because this is my suggestion to you. If something has meaning, it's remembered better. If it has personal meaning, it goes on the priority list. So as I'm talking about these things, start thinking of students you've worked with. So going to stick with you longer. You're going to have a better understanding. You're going to put bring personal memory into it. You might even bring emotion. Because we use those students off the ones you're emotional about. I'm going to talk about the peer response paradigm in a, in a little bit. Again, hippocampus is where consolidation, working memory gets converted to long-term memory. And as it says here, it can take days to months to happen. Long-term memory takes a long time you know, to really consolidate. Basal ganglia is an area that when I first got into here, we did not really have the knowledge that we have now. That and cerebellum are two areas that we've increased our knowledge unbelievably in the last 10 years. And I've come to appreciate that the basal ganglia areas, and it's broken down in all these areas called the putamen and the caudate nucleus and globus pallidus and blah, 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 blah. The term that I want you to come out of here with that's dealing with the basal ganglia, and this is another view of it, and all these structures go into being the basal ganglia. And I want you to think in terms of the basal ganglia, there's one area of some of these things that's called the striatal system of the striatum. Anybody here deal with ADHD? That's the cause of ADHD. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Very specifically. And why does it occur? I want you to think of the basal ganglia doing two things, primarily. It's a filter system. It filters out inappropriate responses. In other words, it's the basis for inhibition. This inhibition occurs between what's going on between the prefrontal cortex areas and the basal ganglia areas. You're basically, you're not filtering. What are tics? Tics is the impulses. Motor impulses are verbal impulses that are not being filtered. What is OCD compulsions? Or obsessions? Again, it's a filtering problem. Right? Very simply, OCD and tic disorders like Tourette's are there because of problems with the basal ganglia, connections with the prefrontal cortex. Now, it's a very simplified version of it, but I think if you start thinking in terms of that, you, you can sort of see something going on here. We talk about spectrum disorders, autism spectrum disorders, which I'll go into a little bit. 
I think one of the truest spectrum disorders, and in talking with other people, we're, we're, I'm finding more and more people are seeing the same thing. OCD and Tourette's is probably a spectrum disorder. If you've ever worked with a severe Tourette's kid, or even mild Tourette's kid, they usually have very much OCD tendencies as well. One of the things that we know that happens with ADHD is if you give stimulants to some of these kids, they start ticking. Why? The basal ganglia areas in the prefrontal cortex, so especially the basal ganglia, loves the neurotransmitter dopamine. When we're doing stimulants, it's producing more dopamine. You know, it's actually not producing more, but there's mechanisms that are creating more availability of it. What is happening with a tick disorder in OCD is it's usually too much dopamine. If you know anybody with Parkinson's and Huntington's, one of them is too much dopamine, one of them is too little. And again, medically, I don't remember which one, but you, you probably do. Um, so, our neurotransmitters are, are absolutely critical in this. This is why we need to watch those ADHD kids who don't have enough dopamine, that we don't overproduce it, and we send the other side into creating ticks. This is why, if you ever see one of your ADHD kids start ticking, you need to notify the parents and get the physician to get the kid off it right away. If you don't, they can become permanent. Now, supposedly, the medication does not create the tick disorder. The child already had a propensity for it. It probably would have come out at some point in time anyway. But we do know that if we don't get the child off of the, uh, the stimulant, they may be able to go back on it later, especially if they're taking another medication you know, with it. But you want to get that child off of it. Um, oh, one, one thing, I, I, just as a general kind of thing, there's, when we talk about brain function, we're, we're, gonna, we're basically going to be talking about two things. Some are neurotransmitter problems. A neurotransmitter problem is going to be helped with medication. There's other disorders, such as mental retardation and autism, that are structural disorders. Medication may work on some of the symptoms, but they're not going to work on the disorder because the structure of the brain has something wrong with it. It's not doing something it should be doing, or it's not doing it efficiently. Right. Sometimes there's no transmitters involved with some of the things, but it's not the basic cause. I'm talking about here, like with ADHD. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about depression. You know, you know, some of these things are no transmitter, and that's why the medications work. We don't have a magic pill for retardation and autism, and the reason for it is there's structural problems. Um, the other thing that it says here, basal ganglia is a, is a, has to do with movement. And we've always known that. But it has to do a lot more than just movement. Um, as I said, it acts as a filter, blocking the execution of movements that are unsuited to the situation. That's basically what ADHD is. We're not filtering. The big thing that the basal ganglia does, though, and the reason you're able to sit here and listen to me and not be conscious of everything that you're doing, I mean, think about what you're doing as you're sitting here. Your eyes are blinking, you're breathing. Well, breathing's different, but, but you're doing a lot of things. You make yourself comfortable. I see people fidgeting and stuff, and you're moving around. You're doing things unconsciously because of habit. We are an efficient organism because of our ability to have everything become habits. And that's what the basal ganglia is essentially trying to do. Every time there's a novel new task, it wants to make it into a habit. And so one of the things that, that we're doing is just trying to, is to facilitate these basal ganglia areas and to help make things into habits. Obviously, sometimes what we need to do is get them away from being a habit. And that's why unlearning it is so much more difficult because it's involving so many systems. These disorders all have something to do with basal ganglia. Can't read it. Schizophrenia, OCD, depression, Tourette's, autism, attention deficit. 
We're going to talk a little bit about executive functions. We're going to be talking about three major areas and one sub area. We're going to be talking about the dorsolateral. On the sheet I gave you, that's called, I'm calling it the regulator of cognition. We're going to be looking at the orbital frontal areas, and incidentally, the dorsolateral areas, this is the outer cortex, it's essentially right around there. Both sides, got one. We're going to talk about orbital frontal areas. The orbital frontal area is the regulator of emotions. That's these areas down here and then the inside here. There's an area of the orbital frontal that is sort of between the two. Again, these are growth approximations. Sometimes it's called the ventral lateral, sometimes the medial lateral, the lateral medial. I mean, it's got all different kinds of names. It basically is the area though, where disinhibition is going to occur. All right, so that's the minor area. There are basic neural tracts between these areas and different areas of the basal ganglia. Right, then there's three major tracts. Two of them are the dorsolateral area, the regulator of cognition, and the other one being the orbital frontal, the regulator of emotions. And then there's this other area down here. It's right above the corpus callosum, which is the area that connects the two hemispheres. On that original slide was that thing called the limbic cortex. It's called the, the cingulate gyrus. The anterior, or front portion of it, we're going to call the regulator of motivation. I also, I also have found, it's helpful sometimes to think of this lazy, lazy student syndrome. Because these are the, the, if you've got a really non-functioning anterior cingulate area, motivationally you appear to be lazy. We'll go through I'm talking about a little bit more. Again, another diagram trying to show how some of these connections are. You know, go, go me down and how these are all systems. And again, I'm simplifying everything, really simplifying. These are the psychiatric and educational disorders that have to do with your prefrontal cortex. Part we're going to call executive function. Three areas. ADHD, LD, and particularly that verbal LD, social perception, working memory, OCD, bipolar depression, anxiety, tics, Tourette's, Asperger, autism, PDD, schizophrenia, conduct disorders, and personality disorders. Anybody got a social emotional disorder besides these? Executive function have to do with everything. Literally. We're viewing it as three general areas and one sub-area. Regulatory center for cognition, regulatory center for emotions, the regulatory center for motivation, and the regulatory center for inhibition. And the chart that I gave you breaks it down like this. When you're doing a case, what I have my students do, what I have my practice students do, what I have my interns do, is I make them take two highlighters. And when they're, when they're working with the kid, when they're done working with the kid, you take your highlighter. One color is going to, you're going to highlight as definite. See this behavior. Another one, possible. I need to leave blank to get a third highlighter for the ones, not a problem. It is amazing if you do this, all of a sudden it's going to jump out at you what areas are involved. And I really have found it really helpful to break down executive function disorders further and we're out of cognition, emotion, motivation, and ambition. Because knowing that helps me design interventions. It helps me understand. Why do some ADHD kids have emotional ups and downs and others don't? It's because of what's involved. Why do some ADHD kids, especially ADD kids without the H, have such problems with task initiation and others don't? Why do some of them seem so disorganized and everything else, but emotionally, you know, they're fine. This answers your question. It also helps us when we start looking at, at other areas like anxiety disorders. We're going to find anxiety disorders have more to do with the, the, the most emotional areas. The orbital frontal. The other thing is, if I have an attack dorsolateral, the regular cognition, 
kind of behavior therapy is going to be effective. If I don't, I'm going to have to start with environmental things. And possibly, especially if the inhibition areas aren't, aren't working, I might have to use medication to be successful initially. Because the child doesn't have the ability to do it. And my, in the last class, I, one of the questions was raised. Our parents in Ireland aren't like your parents in the United States. They're very, very resistant to medication. A lot of our parents are too, except for we've got some physicians and teachers who are over-prescribing medication. My teachers don't prescribe it, they recommend it. I'm probably taking more kids off of meds than put on. But I have worked with kids. You're not going to be successful with it if they don't. Let me ask you a question. The student you're working with has juvenile diabetes. Do you have a problem with them using uh, taking insulin? No. Then no. why? Physiological. They can't do anything about it, right? Well, if you have a really defective prefrontal cortex that's not capable of controlling, why do you have a problem giving medication? Why don't you see if it works? The nice thing about, about quick release Ritalin in is if you, if you start with that one, you're going to know if it works within 48 hours. Usually within four hours. Because in the system it works, it doesn't work. When I know something, most parents, when it starts to work, they don't want to get off of it. I know, I've also heard that you've got problems with doctors prescribing it and things. What I want to do is just make you aware. Because these are battles you may have to start fighting. But there are some kids who need medication for ADHD. Just like there are some kids who may need medication for anxiety. So there are certain anxiety disorders you may have to use medication with to be successful. <coughs> Does it mean that you have to keep them on it? No. <coughs> Especially with adolescents, as the prefrontal cortex starts kicking in. The prefrontal cortex doesn't really start kicking in until adolescence. <coughs> it starts taking over. And as you get older, you're able to use your prefrontal cortex to isolate more and more emotions and behavior. And you can use the medication, reduce it. Sometimes you get to get off of it. But sometimes you need it to get started. There's always so much you can do with environmental controls. You eventually have to get those internal things. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. The dorsolateral, the, the regulator of cognition, is the first area that's on your sheet there. It's the area usually associated with ADHD. And something that I think helps me in working with kids and parents. Barclay and some other people are looking at it as a dimensional disorder. That what ADHD is is really a developmental disorder. In that it appears that the children's probably prefrontal cortex kinds of functions, are about one-third delayed. What this means is if you have a nine-year-old, they're going to behave like a six-year-old. If you have a 15-year-old, they're going to behave like a 10-year-old. What's interesting if you ever work with, the, with, with uh, adults, right around 26, 27, 28, in you know, their 30s, they start <coughs> being able to control more than they could before, but they're still going to be behaving like a 30-year-old. That's because a 30-year-old will now be acting like a 20-year-old. Now, I've been ADHD all my life, I've been told. Fortunately, I've been bright enough to compensate for it. But I like this thought of one-third, because as a 60-year-old, not a 40. Once you work for other things. But it does help when you look at your kids. Okay, I'm not necessarily going to go through all these behaviors with you. All right? But if you, if you look at these behaviors and you're assessing a kid, it's so easy just to highlight, but you need to be looking at them. These are all have to do with cognition. Planning, organization, self-monitoring. Those are the basic three things I usually start out with. All right? Goal setting, anticipation, generating hypotheses, sustaining focus of attention. When, when I do evaluations, I'm breaking attention down into four types of attention. I look at sustained attention, divided attention, shifting attention, and selective focused attention. All right? And there, there's a test on the market that, that tests this stuff really well. It's important to break down attention in these things. I don't have time to go into this one. This is another workshop for you. Or you start reading on it. You know why it is, but, but it's really important to break down attention. It's not just an attention problem. 
There's a big difference between divided attention, which a lot of ADHD kids, incidentally, aren't real good at, but they are real good. Oh, I'm going to tell you, shifting attention, they're not real good at, but divided attention, they are very good at. Divided attention, you might look at as multitasking. Really, to do it for things at once. An ADHD kid that's got good shifting attention, these are the kids that you put a earphone on, you let them listen to music while they're trying to do their homework. It works. And incidentally, it may not be the music you want to listen to. I got one of my ADHD students, ACDC is all he wants to listen to to concentrate. Me going, ugh. But that's what he uses to concentrate. If I put on some soft music, it'll go ballistic on So I'm give things to do. But it does work with some ADHD kids, especially males. We know, well, one of the things we know about male, male female brains, you know, not, that's, I should say, male. Organized brains are organized like a male brain, what we call a male brain, about 80%. It's different than female. Female have a general brain. Uh, things appear to be in both hemispheres. You know, emotions are in both hemispheres, languages in both hemispheres, visual spatial abilities. Males, on the other hand, are specialists. They're really, really good at some things, and they're really, really not good at other things. And one of the big ones is. Most males have language on the left hemisphere. Just a doubt, left hemisphere is positive emotions. Right hemisphere is where they put store emotions and, and visual spatial things. This is one of the reasons why in a lot of other situations, you know, males may be able to multitask in some kinds of areas better than females can. On the other hand, talking about emotions doesn't work. Because they're located in separate hemispheres. <laughs> Right? So there, is, there really is a reason, physiologically, and why. There's some differences. Um, it's also probably the reason why we have a higher representation of males with things like learning disabilities. If you have representation of both hemispheres, it's easier for another hemisphere because of the concept of plasticity to take over. You know, a, a, a young female may never have the problem because of the, the other, an area that would normally be taking the bulk of it. It's taking it. It's there is hemispheric differences with females. You know, one, te one tends to be stronger than the other in some of these things. It's just there's more in equal representation. Right? So. What do I want to say? Oh. Um, oh, attention. But this is one of the reasons why, especially ADHD males, this tends to work better with divided attention than females. I found a real difference when I'm working with them with the divided attention. Um, something we don't think of with ADHD kids. We think of physical fatigue when people are doing things. An ADHD kid who's concentrating on a task is going to become mentally fatigued much quicker than the normal child because they're exerting so much more mental energy. It's physically more exhausting for them, but it's also mentally. We need to build in mental breaks for ADHD kids, especially if we're asking them you know, to be doing things. They will literally, physically, use up all their mental energy. That's something we usually don't think about. We need to build in mental breaks. Um, scanning ability, sensory stimuli over stimulation. All right. Abstract reasoning gets developed at two different stages. Okay? The first stage of abstract reasoning coming in is when the areas of the cortex called parietal lobes, which is involved with intersensory integration, starts developing. This is when myelination, white matter, fatty tissue starts you know, creating, and we have dendritic growth occurring, and then we have pruning when it's all disappearing. And you have no idea what I'm talking about, some of you, and I'm just going to say, it's all stuff you need to learn. But anyway, what happens with, the, with that area around age 8 to 10, they start developing. And they're developing what we call abstract reasoning. The abstract reasoning that we use in our intelligence tests. Primarily measuring abstract reasoning contained here. It's basically simpler abstract reasoning, too complex abstract reasoning. But it's not the most complex abstract reasoning. This room is filled with people who did do metacognition. Meta-abstract reasoning. You know, you're, go you're going above and beyond that. That's being done by the prefrontal cortex. Again. The dorsolateral area is the regulator of cognition. It's when all this has occurred. Right? 
And this is why you become such a much better problem solver with adolescents. And the older the adolescent is, obviously the better. Good news for those of you who are still in your 20s, early 30s. If you keep using metacognition, the kinds of things, you keep learning, taking classes, going workshops like this, you're continuing to develop your frontal lobes. Everybody is capable of increasing the dendritic growth throughout your lifetime. We know that this is one of the things that halts dementia, Alzheimer's, both physical exercise and mental exercise. But with 20 year olds, the more education you're getting, the more exposure to metacognition, the more you're developing a prefrontal cortex. I know my meta thinking at my age right now is much better than it was 20 years ago. And because there's things that I've been able to grasp that I couldn't grasp 20 years ago. So it's continued. And I really look at you younger people and say, use it. Keep developing. All working memory involves the regular cognition of dorsolateral areas. Time management, elapsed time, high order thinking. All right, now we're going to go on to the orbital frontal areas. The regulation of emotion. All right, I'm supposed to stop here, aren't I? Yes. What? Don't stop. Don't stop. You're an artist. Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> You're an artist, so don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to get to the executive function. You guys are so passionate. I was playing it. I was going to see through this stuff because I really thought you were going to do a lot of repeats from <laughs> the other two days. This is some of the stuff I was going around. Um, orbital frontal regulates learning reward punishment. Activated by pleasant, painful touch, taste, smell stimuli. It's where, where gamblers can really get hung up in, in these areas. One of the few tests we have in orbital frontal function has to do with gambling. There's some really neat research that was done on gamblers where their brains just light up differently than a person who doesn't have the gambling addiction. I mean, it, it's just incredible. You can literally, on um, these fMRIs, you can predict who's going to become a compulsive gambler who isn't. By the way, the areas are lighting up. Personally challenged. Everybody remember Phineas Gage, your favorite guy, the famous guy with the railroad spike through his head? Yeah. Hey, all personality changes. Guess where that spike went? Right through the prefrontal cortex, the orbital frontal areas. Um, abilities to inhibit, evaluate, act on social, emotional decision making. Guess which part with Asperger kids is really affected? Again, emotional regulation, your general affective state, mood anxiety, emotional ability, depression, mania, modulating emotions so that they're appropriate. Have you ever worked with that Asperger kid who starts laughing at a funeral? Or mm -hmm. a Morality, personality change, frustration tolerance, whether well, or not optimist or pessimist. Optimists tend to be very, a little bit more in the left hemisphere. Pessimists tend to be a little more right hemisphere. Awareness, acceptance of personal responsibility. In other words, adolescence. Ability to inhibit, evaluate, act on social, adjusting behaviors, adapt to changes in real contingency, empathy, tactlessness. Um, again, autistic like behaviors. Reading nonverbal communication, understanding idioms, empathy, reading and understanding the emotions of others. Pilot by pilot. Who did I just describe? Nonverbal LD and Asperger, didn't I? Very different than autistic, is it now? The profile of Asperger's are very different than autistic. So these people say it's a spectrum disorder, I disagree with. Spectrum disorder, I think, is a single branch. What I see autism is, is they've got a commonality, then Asperger shoots off as a branch, and autism goes on, PDD. And from a you know, psychological standpoint, very different areas of brain being used. Impulse and addition, impulse control, interrupting conversations. My biggest problem, even at my age, I used to. I cannot stop interrupting conversations. It drives me crazy. I try it, I try it, I try it, and I still going to do it. Reactive aggression. Incidentally, do you have ever people be reactive aggression or proactive aggression? Reactive aggression is that kid is walking down the hallway, and somebody bumps into him, turns around and whacks him. You know, or somebody says something about their mother, and immediately they go, 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 go ballistic. Proactive aggression, 
uh, the ones who scare me, that's mm -hmm. Columbine. Mm -hmm. Right. That has nothing to do with front row. That's that sociopath. No, sorry, it's just Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, symptoms, I'm going to fight this. I'm just going to do want to give some interior singular because it's the one that people don't understand. It's the least one. We don't have good test for it. It's the regulatory center for motivation. Oh, I missed it. I'll leave it up in here. All right, the last one that's down there, motivation, task initiation, shifting attention, generation of new concepts, they spread, they, they show minimal affect. It's not that they don't experience emotion. Remember, mm -hmm. affect is expression of emotion. What these kids do, they're the ones with the very flat affect. They need cueing. They're very apathetic. Limited spontaneous speech. Very slow process of speed in almost all areas. These are the slugs. You know, you can't get moving. You wish you could just get a cattle prod and go, no, no, get moving, move along. Um, sometimes they're very indifferent to pain, thirst, or hunger. This is a single sheet. I don't think Yeah, I, I, I'm doing good. This is, I'm going <coughs> off of your sheet, but it looks like this. You got your function sheet. Oh, okay. Okay? Now, the very bottom. Yeah. Couldn't find on there quick enough. Everything that's on these slides is summarized on the sheet when it comes to the executive functions. That's what I'm saying. If you want to blow it up and make it into two pages, do so. But you'll, you'll find it handy if you start using it. All right. The reason I call it the lazy kid syndrome is that's literally what happens. These are the kids that people call lazy. A lot of times they're not lazy, but they have it as a fact of it here singular. These are the kinds of kids, you know, we can't get moving. You know, they, they'll sit there, literally sit there until somebody comes along and starts them. They don't show affect. Their attention spans are very poor. Here's the big reason why. One of the things that here singular does is got a switch. I'm in the external world, switch off, I'm in the internal world. What we see is usually daydreaming. Okay? That kid that, and that sometimes they have even worse attention spans than our ADHD kids. These are the true ADD kids. You have a ten of them. They'll sit there like a bump on the log doing nothing if you allow them to. But one of the worst things we can do for them is provide them with external assistance all the time. Because what we do with the father, we foster learn helplessness. I get real tired of special ed, and I actually have the same problem here in Ireland with one-to-one aides, or an aid for every three or four children, because these children don't have to ever learn on their own. And there are strategies you can use to do it. Since so we're running out of time, I'm going to pass these around. I'm always asked, what are the interventions? Three outstanding books I've put out in the last three years. This book by Metzler is outstanding. This is all my bibliography, right? It's got really good classroom-wide interventions. This book by Peg Dawson and Richard Gary. Peg Dawson and, and Gary are <coughs> the absolute experts. I've written a number of books on it. This is their latest one. My intern, who did a review of all the uh, seven books on executive function, found this one to be the best, which did the review. She had used it to write behavior plans and everything else. And it really comes out really good for the individual. After she did her review of the seven articles, this one came out. And she, as well as three other people I know that have got all three books, are all in agreement. If you had to pick one, this is the one. Who's that? Christopher Coffin. Christopher Coffin. Mm -hmm. All right. I've been passing these out. I don't know how long you want me to continue going. Yeah, she's still stepping All right. Sorry about this. I'll uh, spread them out. That's great. Here, I'll start this one here. Sorry, I'm going to start this one back here. That way at least somebody at least get to see some of the things. All right. I'm going to just show you what's available on these slides. Um, I do want to... Anxiety disorders. If we look at brain function, we're able to look at the anxiety disorders as two different types. Some are started in the subcortical areas. 
um, and some are started in the prefrontal cortex. All right. The ones that are started subcortically are things like phobias, PTSD, uh, panic disorders. Ones that are, are created by the cortex, the over the frontal areas, are things like uh, generalized anxiety disorders, social anxiety disorders, things like that. We're, they're created by what we call ants, automatic negative thoughts. Right? These are usually very amenable by cognitive behavioral therapy, relaxation therapies, all these kinds of therapies. Your subcortical ones may or may not be. One of the reasons we have such a problem with PTSD is because of why they occur. And I do want to... When the fear response gets stuck in the high response cycle, this is why. Uh, we are built for fight flight. Okay? It's what saved us, uh, uh, you know, in our phylogenetically from the caveman days on here. Because we have two ways of reacting to fear. If fear has high value, what happens is you get an immediate response. There's no conscious action. You have a startle reflex reaction. What you basically have is the stimulus comes in, goes to the thalamus, that gateway, who then sends it immediately to the amygdala, who sends immediately to a reaction. Right? In other words, I'm walking with my four-year-old grandson, and I've got him by the hand, and all of a sudden we're approaching the highway, street to cross, and he starts to dart. I don't sit here going, gee, Ryan is going to hurt himself. I go, boom. No thought. It's automatic. I'm in high fear response. What happens with PTSD is that. And it gets stuck in that. That stimulus comes out. How do you break that cycle? And that's the big problem we have. What happens with phobias? That's why we have to put, when we're doing phobia therapies, we have to do things to put the person in that phobia. We're trying the way to desensitize. You're starting with things, you're slowly approaching. Or you do flooding techniques where you're just putting them in there and, and make them react to it. They're trying to do it. No, which is one of the reasons. That's why panic attacks, we just about have to use medications. Right? PTSD, we're finding. Low stimulus, on the other hand, something with low fear, it'll delay response. It's cognitive mediated reaction. What happens here? Information comes in through our, one of our sense organs, eyes, ears, goes to the thalamus. The thalamus says, oh, no immediate action is needed. Let's process this one. Goes to the sensory cortex. Well, the sensory cortex goes to the prefrontal cortex, which then sends it to the amygdala for a reaction. It's cognitive mediated. What happens with our automatic negative thoughts and our ants is it's in the prefrontal cortex, and the prefrontal cortex says, we've got problems. I don't like going to school. And so it starts this. We can mediate that. We don't need us any medication for those kinds of problems. Continue on if we can. Oh, again, um, you guys are going to have to read on your own. Bottom up, what we call this bottom up anxiety disorders at top down. Look at some of the stuff. Then I had some interesting stuff for you guys on autism. I understand you had a good workshop on Asperger and autism last year. Mm -hmm. uh, did you go into some of the physiological, neurological stuff? Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a little bit, real quick. We're, 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 gonna, we're talking. We're talking about white matter. We're going to talk about communication problems. These are different kinds of cells that autistic children usually have less of, or some of them have none of, including mirror neurons, which is where empathy comes from, which is one of the reasons why we're working with the early infants. You want to do tongue movements to them and see if they imitate you. If they're imitating you, it's an indication of, of mirror neurons. If they're not, red flag number one. You can do that test easy enough with, with the 10 and 12 month olds. Uh, these are various cells. These are the components of empathy, where they're coming from, which are the cells, reason for survivabilities, oxytocin, the cuddle hormone, the one that makes mamas and infants bond. 
we find that autistic children do not have the quantities of it, especially in certain areas, but especially in one area right here. It's called right fusiform gyrus area. It has to do with facial recognition. Autistic children do not analyze faces as do normals. They, where normals tend to look at the eyes. If I take a face and I rotate it 180 degrees, literally, you know, or where the mouth is up, up and there, I can put your children, your grandchildren in there, or your parents in there, and you won't recognize them. An autistic child, if they recognize them in the first place, will. Doesn't matter the orientation, because their orientation to a face is totally different. They're looking at details. We tend to focus in on what the eyes are. You know, other little, 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 little details. An autistic child looks below the eyes when they first start gazing, and you can actually watch an autistic child when you're doing an evaluation on how they're looking at a face. The other thing is, is they will tend to look at a picture. They will not look at the people first; they look at the things. Sometimes all I'll do is I'll get, I'll get a picture that's got lots and lots of things out of people and activities going on. Give to the autistic child and I tell them, "Tell me what you see." It's amazing how many of them don't give you the people. Simple tests. But again, it's because of the right fusiform area. When you put an fMRI on an autistic child, the left one lights up, the right one doesn't. They're interpreting the information using a different brain area. Facial recognition, gaze, processing, yes, that's it. Okay. I'm only 10 minutes over. We started 10 minutes late. We started 10 minutes late, but now. Thank you.